Tonight, I think I want to share with you one of the ex most exciting truths that the Lord showed to me in this area of biblical interpretation. I, I hope that uh, some of these uh, pillar concepts have kind of uh, filtered through as having priority. Number one, that we have to interpret the Bible in light of the original inspired author's intent. Interpretation starts with the original author, not with us. That's principle, presupposition number one. Principle number two, the best way to interpret the ancient author is in context, historical context and literary context. And the Bible should be interpreted by paragraphs and not by verses. That's a foundational thought. Now this third foundational thought, I can still remember the day in Southwestern Seminary when Bill Hendricks said this, and it was like an aha moment in my mind. Let me give you a little background before the aha moment. <laughs> I really do believe the Bible is the only source for faith and practice. I really believe it is the only clear self-revelation of the one true God. And yet, when I come to it, it seems like that it contradicts itself on many issues. One book says to say one thing, another book seems to say another. So here, in a book that I am committed to for salvation and life, what verse do I go to? And the denominations that I have come across experientially, one group quotes these verses, another group quotes these verses, but they're all in the Bible. How do I deal with what seems to be paradox, what seems to be dialectical tension within the Scripture that I believe is from God? Now, that's, that's the tension I felt. And I felt it on a number of, of levels and a number of issues. And then Bill Hendricks said this, and it was like a hot sear in my mind. He said, the reason that Western people do not understand the Bible is because the Bible is Eastern literature. Pow! You see, I'd been trying to interpret the Bible in light of Western historical, Western literary, Western modes of thought. The truth is, I'd been trying to interpret a Hebrew Bible in Greek categories, and it was not working well. And then he said that Eastern people do not present truth in propositions. Greek thought presents truth in propositions. Western culture presents truth in propositions. It's not that the Bible doesn't have propositions, but it presents its doctrine in tension-filled pairs, in parables, in stories, in dialogues. Now, it's not which way of presenting truth is good or right. That's not the issue. The issue is different cultures present truth in different ways. Without even thinking about it, I was more influenced by my day, my culture, and the way that Western people think, and I was having problems interpreting an Eastern book that I believed was from God. Now, when I saw that, it really started solving some problems and caused me to begin to think about these things. So I first want to kind of present this, then I'll, I'll read through my notes. That's the last, of, uh, the last set of outlines. I became to realize that doctrines are presented in combinations of truths. Now, the best analogy that I could think of is constellations of stars. If you go out tonight in the Northern Hemisphere, most nights you can see Orion. Now, Orion, the warrior, is made up of four large stars on the corner and a series of stars that kind of sort of look like a stick person with a belt and a sword. You know Orion. And what I found in both my life and my denomination and the life of Western denominations was that they were saying things like this, I really like Orion's belt. 
Orion's belt is the best part of that constellation. You just can't, nothing else counts but Orion's belt. No, no, wait a minute. There's a sword and there are arms and legs on Orion. And yet denominations focus in on one of these groups of stars, make it the brightest star, the only star. Orion is only Orion when all the stars are in place. Christianity is only Christianity when all the stars are in place and the Bible gets to speak as a whole, not as a proof text, isolated, western, propositional truth formula. Bingo. Now, the bingo came in the number of eras. Now, I'm going to get them in just a minute. Where I, if I had a blackboard, we could list the number of inspired texts in the Bible that support this side of the dialectic and support this side of the dialectic. I do not believe as a fundamental truth that any Christian has the right to pick one inspired text to the detriment, exclusion, or isolation of another inspired text. Now, you hear what I'm saying to you? If the Bible is the Word of God and it presents truth in tension-filled pairs, I must start rethinking how I accept truth. And God revealed himself to a particular culture at a particular time in a particular way that culture could understand, and we are not that culture. So we're going to have to go back and rethink how we do this. Now, at the time, my first church was in Lubbock. I don't know if you've been out in West Texas. There is a highway. There are two bar ditches, because water can't run anywhere, and two barbed wire fences, and they run all the way to Quebec, it's the same field all the way up to Canada. And I began to realize that what was happening is that God presented truth. Now listen to me because this is going to be a little shocking at first. God presented truth in the barbed wire fences. But he didn't want us to get tangled up in the barbed wire fence. But he presented this truth clearly, forcibly, contextually. Here's a truth. But the problem is there is another clearly contextual biblical truth that is on the other barbed wire fence. Now, it doesn't matter if you're in the left ditch or the right ditch. You in the ditch if you don't get this presenting truth this way. And what these two doctrines are meant to do is not me to raise a flag and say, I like this doctrine, my mother likes this doctrine, Baptists like this doctrine. That's not your job. Your job is to live in the tension and stay on the road. Your job is to live in the tension of Eastern presented truths. And what we're doing is forming denominations on, on isolated proof texting of certain passages and usually not even complete context. Now, with that in mind... I'd like you to turn to the, the page that's dealing with this and um, let me find it quickly. It's going to be about page uh, 39 on your notes. I'm around there. It's Roman numeral D. I've entitled it The Big Picture, Biblical Paradoxes. I want to read some of this and then I want to illustrate it. This insight has been the most helpful to me personally as one who loves and trusts the Bible as God's Word. In trying to take the Bible seriously, it became obvious that different texts reveal truth in selected, not systematic ways. One inspired text cannot cancel or depreciate another inspired text. Truth comes in knowing all Scripture. Parenthesis, all Scripture, not just some, is inspired. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. Close parenthesis, not quoting a single passage. Parenthesis, proof texting. Now here's what I've heard in conservative Christianity most of my life. It's a bumper sticker at one time. If the Bible says it, that settles it. How many of you heard that slogan? It is not true. It is an overstatement. It is a Western philosophical statement. It is a statement of a church that has respect for the Bible, love for the Bible, but is trying to force an Eastern book into Western categories. 
If the Bible says it, I must take it seriously because of my presuppositional commitment to the inspiration and uniqueness of Scripture. But then as the second step, I must, I must, and you must find out what else the Bible says on the same subject before you make any dogmatic pronouncements in God's name. Would you agree with that? Number two, most biblical truths, Eastern literature, are presented in dialectical or paradoxical pairs. Remember, New Testament authors, except for Luke, are Hebrew thinkers writing in common or street Greek. I think what I just said. Most of the New Testament authors are Hebrew thinkers writing in street Greek. So their thought process is not Greek. Their thought process is Hebrew. Hebrews are Eastern thinkers. Now think with me for a minute what I'm trying to say here. Wisdom literature is one key Old Testament genre. Uh, wisdom literature and Hebrew poetry go hand in hand. Hebrew poetry, wisdom literature, presents truth in several ways, but the two that affect the way they understand truth is parallel we call it synonymous parallelism, where two lines of poetry say the same thing a little different. Now, that is our concept of parallel passages. The other way that Hebrew literature, wisdom literature, Hebrew poetry presents truth is what we call antithetical parallelism, where one line says one thing and the next line says exactly the opposite. Paradox, dialectical tension. Now, the truth is not in line A or line B. The truth is in the intersect of line A and line B. The truth is where those two opposites come together. Now, see, <laughs> this is difficult for us because we're Western thinkers. So I want to ask you a series of questions. I am not going to elaborate on each of these doctrines. But I want to ask you a series of questions. And I do believe, if given enough time, I could present numerous biblical contexts for each of these doctrines that I'm going to talk about. Okay? Do you believe in predestination, Calvinism? <laughs> do you believe in predestination, or do you believe in human free will? And the biblical answer is, Absolutely. Now you say, explain how they work. You need to pay a preacher more if you want that answer. <laughs> it amazes me when I think of the tension in the Bible. And today, if you don't think Calvinism is the place that Baptists are fighting, you do not know theology in Baptist life. We fought over the place of women. We fought over the place of tongues. And now we're fighting over the place of Calvin. And I submit to you that John Calvin would throw up over modern Calvinism. What people have done is take the logical extension of Calvin's thought to its absolute remotest extension and then built the doctrines and excluded everybody but themselves on those doctrines. The five uh, points of Calvinism, the tulip acrostic. Now, I certainly believe there is no place to start a theology apart from the sovereignty of God. There is no place. The Bible is about God. Is God God? Have you read Romans 9 lately? I'm God. Sit down and shut up is the paraphrase. I'll do what I want to, thank you. I'll have mercy on whom I want to. I'm going to build some vessels for the kitchen. I'm going to build some vessels for the outhouse. And I get to build the vessel. And the clay cannot say to the potter, make me so and so. The Bible says that no one can come to the Father unless the Holy Spirit draws them. John 6, 44 and 65. Is the sovereignty of God or predestination a biblical truth? Absolutely. But I'm not willing to throw away John 3, 16 or John 1, 12 or any other number of texts that says, whoever receives him, as many as believe in him, whosoever shall call the name of the Lord, Romans 10, those are also inspired biblical texts. 
There is no place for judgment if there is no place for a moral responsibility for the acts of human beings affected and influenced, but though they may be. So does the Bible teach predestination or does the Bible teach human free will? The answer is absolutely. But I guarantee you denominations form and divide over that truth. Let me go a few more. Does the Bible teach the security of the believer or does the Bible teach the perseverance of the saints? I know who you are. You're on the side of the security of the believer. But I want to tell you the missing doctrine in Southern Baptist life is to him who overcomes, I will give the crown of life. The answer to every one of the seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3 and any numerous other places where perseverance, particularly James and 1 John, is the emphasis of the biblical book. We are so committed to Romans 4 and justification by faith and an initial assurance that we've ignored James 2, 14 through 26 that says, faith without works is dead. And James is as inspired as Paul. And you don't get to choose which one you like. Do you believe in original sin is the reason we're lost? Or do you believe that you're lost because you've chosen personally to sin? Absolutely. Have you been affected by Adam? Absolutely. Are you going to stand before God and say, Adam made me do it? Absolutely not. You're going to start stand before God for choosing to go against the revealed will of God that you understood. Are we affected by Adam? Absolutely. i got several of these you can tell. Hang on. Is Jesus God or is Jesus a man? <laughs> is Jesus equal to the Father or is Jesus subservient to the Father? How many times does Jesus say, I don't speak my own words, I don't do my own thing, I only say what I hear the Father say, I only do what the Father tells me to do? Is Jesus subservient or is Jesus equal? Just line up the text. Boom. And there are numerous ones on each side. Is the Bible God's word or is the Bible written under human authorship? Why do different biblical authors use different vocabulary for the same theological truths? Why do biblical authors use bad grammar? The Spirit doesn't know how to do grammar. How come Paul starts sentences and never finishes them? God spoke to the hearts of human beings who were receptive to him and led by him, but he used their vocabulary, their experiences, and, and their way of communicating truth. Do you believe in sinlessness, often called perfectionism, or do you believe in sinning less? Do you believe that Jesus, when he died, freed us potentially from all sin? Or do you believe the goal of the Christian is just sinning less and less as they grow older? Baptists are on the sinning less and less side. But I submit to you, you read Romans 6, it says that Jesus has pulled the power plug to the sin nature. Jesus' death was significant enough to fully impact the sinner. The problem is you and I are addicted to sin and we love it, and we keep plugging the thing back in. But Jesus dealt with it. I hope you'll read Romans 6 again. Most of my life, I've heard sinning less, and then I read Romans 6 carefully. Do you believe in initial, instantaneous justification and sanctification, or do you believe in progressive sanctification? Let me unpack that. Do you believe that the moment we trust Jesus Christ that we have his righteousness imputed to our account? Do you believe that the moment we're in him, that we are sanctified because of our position in him? Man, the texts are numerous, particularly in Paul. Or do you believe when Matthew says, and, and I, I'm just <laughs> continue to be shocked by this, particularly the Sermon on the Mount, chapter 5, when beginning in that section about 520, where Jesus said to these, this, these people of all kinds sitting there, 
Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will no wise enter the kingdom of God. And they just quit breathing because they thought the scribes and Pharisees were the Billy Grahams of their day. And then in 548, Jesus said this, Be holy as your Father in heaven is holy. So now sanctification is a position that we get at salvation, but is also something we must possess in life. So is it a position or is it a possession? Absolutely. And just think of the denominations that split over that one. Do you believe in justification by faith or do you believe in justification confirmed by works? Now, this is the Romans 4 and James 2, 14 through 26 again. And I would submit to you that both of those are inspired texts. Do you believe Christian freedom or do you believe Christian responsibility? Am I free in Christ? Am I a new man in Christ? If I'm going to make it as radical as I can. Three times in Romans 14, Paul says, everything is clean if you give thanks. Everything is clean if you give thanks. And then Paul says, if this so-called freedom of yours destroys your brother, you don't get it. I am really free in Christ, and I limit myself to be a blessing to the church that I choose to work with. I'm absolutely free, and I am, am absolutely my brother's keeper. Do you believe in God is transcendent or God is imminent? Is he the Holy One? To see him is to die? Or is he Abba, Father, come sit in my lap and tell me about your life? Which is he? Yes. Do you believe, well, do you believe God is ultimately knowable or do you believe he is unknowable? Now, Greek thought says he's unknowable. And, and I want to tell you, Ecclesiastes says he's unknowable. And you read the book of Esther. It's the unseen hand of God in Esther's life. You, those things I were talking to you in Genesis today. Unseen hand of God in barren women. And yet, even in the unseen hand of God, God is knowable to some level. I don't know everything about God, but I know something about God that enables me to trust Him and lean upon Him. I don't know everything, but what I know is true and is adequate for my relationship with him. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? Is there a tension between, if I can't know everything, I don't know anything? No, that's a false deal. It's false. I do know something, and I do know what I know is adequate for a relationship. If I knew everything, there wouldn't be a need for God and me both. Paul uses a number of metaphors for salvation. You cannot imagine. I went to, I went to a... Evangelical Theological Society, they give you a list of the programs, what, what little you know, paper you can go. There was a paper being read that was so shocking, I went to it just because I couldn't believe it. This is the title of the paper. Is C.S. Lewis a Christian? The whole point of this paper was that, and I forgot which one of these C.S. Lewis didn't like, but one of these seven metaphors C.S. Lewis didn't like. Now, five of them he liked. He didn't like one, and this group said he must not be Christian. Every one of these metaphors come from a different area of the Greco-Roman world. Paul pulled metaphors from every area of life to communicate one truth. I mean, we get hung up in the metaphor and miss the multiplicity of metaphors. It shows our problem, not God's. Here's the metaphors. Adoption, that's legal. Sanctification, that's from the temple. Justification, that's legal. Redemptive, that's from the slave block. Glorification, predestination, reconciliation, those are all facets of one diamond. Now, wouldn't I be stupid to say, I really like the diamond looking at it this way, but I don't like the diamond looking at it. Yuck! You missed it. You're Western. You don't get it. You're tearing the Bible up over your own presuppositions. You're making yourself the authority over Scripture. The kingdom of God is present. The kingdom of God is future. There have been times that people say the whole Sermon on the Mount doesn't apply to us, it applies for the millennium. None of these teachings apply now. The kingdom's not here till the future. Well, Jesus said the kingdom is near you, it's in your mouth, talking to people of that day. The kingdom is absolutely here now, and the kingdom is not consummated yet, which is true, yes. 
denomination split on this, will kill each other, will kick you out of their pulpit, will split their church in a minute over this. And both are in the Bible. Demonstratively, over and over in text. Is repentance a gift of God or is repentance a necessary mandate for a human response to an offer of salvation? There are several texts that says God gives them the ability to repent. Did you know that? I don't know if I've listed them here for you or not. may have. I think I listed the ones on the requirement of faith and um, repentance. But there are several texts that say God gives repentance. Now, if you're a Calvinist, you jump on that. And if you're a Baptist, you jump on the other, that you've got to repent and believe. You see, your mama has more to do with this and your favorite preacher and whatever book somebody gave you has more to do with this than Scripture because we're isolating truths and tearing up Orion. I like the belt. I like the sword. I like his right kneecap. Holy spit, that's dumb. Is the Old Testament permanent or is the Old Testament passed away and is null and void? You would think in the modern church... I was just entering a big church, I mean a big church, a mega church, where somebody came and told the Louisiana women that if they ate catfish, shrimp, and and, uh, lobster, that they were out of the will of God. And if they would keep the Levitical food laws and wash their hands in a certain way, they would live longer. And what killed me is those Louisiana women bought it. And I told them, I said, if you believe God doesn't want you to eat shrimp, lobster, catfish, and gumbo, would you mail it to me? Don't you know about Acts 15, the Roman, the the Jerusalem council where Gentiles are not bound by the Mosaic code? Don't you know when Jesus said it, not what goes in a man that defiles him, but what comes out, parenthesis, thereby negating the food laws? What is the matter with Christians? They're dumb. They haven't read the Bible. And they're willing to kill each other over somebody who wrote a book and came to speak in their church and they don't have the Bible knowledge to evaluate what's been said. These texts, the Old Testament, read Galatians 3. Read the book of Hebrews. The Old Testament was never the focus. The Messiah was the focus. The New Testament is not about the Old Testament. The New Testament's about Jesus. We have got to read the Old Testament through the eyes of the radical new revelation in Christ and not read Christ through the eyes of the valid revelation to Moses. I've just been doing this commentary on Genesis. I have been amazed, theologically amazed, when I got into this verse-by-verse way of approaching Scripture, how much of Paul's theology is affected by Genesis 12 through 18, which is Abraham's covenant, not Moses' covenant. Are believers, are they servants or children? (laughs) Are believers servants or children? Yes. (laughs) Yes, they are. Now, these paradoxes, and these are not all of them. These are the ones that I just wrote down after teaching this in many churches and people asking me and struggling with these. I mean, these, you know, when I was younger, when I was a teacher, young people would come to me and ask me a question related to these, these texts. And... What I would do, because this is my gift, I would lay this out for them. I would, I would show them in the Bible where these different sides, I would give them this, and, you know, and they would say to me, oh, yeah, that's real nice. See, they didn't pay a price for it. They hadn't ripped their guts out night after night struggling with the book you claim is from God, and it looks like it contradicts itself. They hadn't been a part of these terrible discussions where one denomination just says, you're not even going to heaven because you don't agree with me. If you haven't put, it, put in the pincher of two dogmatic proof texts in Christians, you don't know the pain that's involved in this. But if you don't pay a price for it, it's just another lesson on hermeneutics. But it can be an eye-opening, life-changing freedom, if you hear what I'm saying. Now, you might say to me, Bob, you've been studying the Bible 40 years. You know your Bible well because this is what you do, but I don't know it that well. So how can I find these paradoxes? It's a great question. And I would say to you that there is a book that most of us are not familiar with that will help you do it. It's a category of theology book called a systematic theology. Now, what these books do, and they're the most biased denominational and theological books available. You never just read one. 
they take the whole Bible and they break it into categories. God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. God, creation. God, salvation. Uh, man, before the fall, after the fall. Uh, salvation, the church, the second coming. They break the whole Bible into categories. Then they take all the verses in the Bible that deal with these subjects and start putting them under these categories. Now, this is not the kind of book you read just before you go to sleep. These, this is worse than slasher movies before you go to sleep. You can't retain this stuff. What you do is, when your Sunday school lesson and your sermon and your Bible study, your personal study, when you have done everything you can to these texts, you have read them several times, you have outlined the literary context, you've looked up some of the words, you've checked everything you can do, then you go to the index of these books and you find your paragraph and you write down the pages where your paragraph is talked about. And you look at the categories. Is this under God the Father? Is this under salvation? Is this under human free will? Is this under the second? You see what categories that page number falls in. Then you go to that page and find your verse. Read the paragraph. If the paragraph is helpful and it tells you something you didn't know, read the page. Because these books are going to lay it out. And suddenly, you find very quickly, if this is the only verse on this subject, one of a hundred verses on this subject, or where there are other verses on this subject. Very quickly. Now, I, I am going to recommend some to you. Um, there have been some that have been very helpful to me. I think the one that has challenged me the most, and when I was growing up, I grew up in a Southern Baptist church, um, I was afraid to think outside the bounds. I was afraid to color outside the lines. Do you understand what I'm saying? And the book that first gave me the freedom to start questioning some of the things I had heard by people I trust, the first book was The Essentials of Evangelical Theology by Donald Bloch in two volumes. He's the first one that said to me, all Christians don't have assurance. He's the first one that said to me, all Christians don't believe in a pre-millennial return of Christ. Now see, when I grew up, those things were unquestionable theological doctrines. Now here is a person, as I read and they showed me the text, I began to see that some of the things that I had been taught had been overstated and proof text. Another one by a wonderful man, out in, he's, he's dead now, so he knows if he's right, I guess. Um, his name is George Ladd. He is the fountainhead of, of what we call historical premillennialism. And he wrote a book called New Testament Theology. He's a professor at Fuller Seminary in California. It's an excellent systematic. A Southern Baptist who wrote a book like this is Frank Stagg that taught at Southern uh, Theological Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky. He has a book on New Testament theology. These are excellent people that I trust. And you go to the index. Now, a really big book by a person who's taught at Baylor and taught where I got my doctor's degree at Trinity Evangelical, and someone you may know from even your reading is Millard Erickson. He's more of an independent Baptist, not a Southern Baptist, but he has wrote a book called Christian Theology, Second Edition. Now, the thing is that big, it'll keep your door open in a hurricane. And you don't want to read that, you'll get... Well, I'm not going to tell you what you'll get... You don't read it. Cost sixty dollars new. Go online and buy it used for fifteen dollars. What do you care if it's got yellow corners or broken back or something? For fifteen dollars, you can be, get the state-of-the-art evangelical Baptist-oriented systematic theology with, I think, twenty-seven pages of index. Now, the reason I've jumped up and down on this is because you've got to be motivated to do this. This is, this is the last step of outlining word study. This is the very last thing you do. And you don't just do one of these, you try to do two or three of them. Because you're about to put this thing together in some kind of hole. You're about to move from the, the, the magnifying glass of exegesis through the telescope of systematic theology. You want to see the big picture. Let me read my last little thing. Number three, use of systematic theologies. This type of reference book is one of the most helpful but most biased. These book, books help us move from one context through the limited scope of biblical theology into the whole Bible. 
Be careful that you do not let systematic theology smother or silence individual texts that do not fit neatly into the theological system of the author. How many times in Baptist Sunday school literature have we jumped the millennium because there's a fight in Baptist life? How many times in Southern Baptist Sunday school literature have we jumped every text that deals with the filling of the Holy Spirit or speaking in tongues because we don't do it? We cannot let these systematic theologians dictate theology. We only go to them at the very end and texts have priority over systematic theologians. Amen? These are biased, thoughtful scholars, but they are not inspired. We use them as a tool to find the paradoxes and the other verses on this subject, but we never go first to these guys. As much as you love them, you don't go first to them. And you never just read one of them. <laughs> Purchase several of these types of books from different theological positions. See the list at the end of the seminar. You don't have that list yet? There'll be several pages that come at the end. A helpful quote from Questions and Answers. Now, I want to tell you this little book, Questions and Answers, by F.F. F. Bruce, out of print, still available for less than $5 on the Internet, has been the greatest help to my life on these tension-filled topics. I can remember as a young preacher struggling with all these issues that Baptists struggle with. The place of women in the church. The place of tongues. Baptism in the name of Jesus versus baptism in the name of the, of the Trinity. All of these terrible texts. I'm a young preacher. I don't know what to do. I'm overwhelmed. I go to a church and this person's mad about this and this person's mad about that and here's a preacher won't let you preach unless you agree with them and holy moly are there agendas running through our life. And this book indexed by topic and text, begin to cause me to have the freedom to rethink out of a Baptist box. Somebody said to me, you, you're just not a traditional Baptist, are you? Well, you listened, didn't you? I'm a Bible Christian, and I'll die with the Bible. I, I am not here to make a Baptist anything. I'm here to stand up for Jesus Christ and the Word of God. And as long as Baptists do that, I'm with them. And when they don't, I'm about to slap them. And they need somebody like me and hate somebody like me. And I'm trying to slap you so you'll know what you believe and where you got it and quit being so judgmental and dogmatic towards people who disagree with you but have their own inspired text. Is the Bible the only source of faith and practice or are you? Are you the standard? Is your mother the fountainhead? Is your denomination closer to Jesus? You'll find it is not. But by the way, before I leave that, if you try to find the perfect denomination and you join it, you'll screw it up. There ain't no perfect denomination. You find the perfect church, it'll die with you. We have to find a system that we can live in and work in and critique the problems we think are in it. Amen? And we don't have to agree. Which one of us has the mind of Christ? Which one of us should be the standard of all theology? I've said to you before, I want to say it again right here. God's will for your and our differences, personality, gifts, and theology is God's way of reaching a lost world which none of us by ourselves can reach. But all of us in our diversity, in the richness of our experience, in our way of understanding the Bible, God can flow through us to reach a lost world. Our pluralism is a blessing from God and we see it as an enemy. We have confused unity with uniformity. F.F. F. Bruce, it is important to remember that when the te te teaching of Scripture is systematized, something is usually left out in the process. That's true. You never start with a systematic theology book. You never start Bible study with a commentary. You, the Bible, and the Holy Spirit are priority. Amen? We are not going to all agree. We, we understand in stages. None of us fully arrive. Differences are not a problem. But do not let a commentator or a systematic theologian grab you by the nose and lead you around. You are significant. God called you to understand his word. You are going to stand before God for what you believe and how you've lived it. And you can't quote Spurgeon or Adrian Rogers or Millard Erickson. And please don't quote Bob because I'm in enough trouble as it is. Lord, thank you, thank you. I remember sitting in Herman Park in Houston, Texas as a young man praying 
that you had helped me understand the Bible. And Lord, I spent my whole life doing that and want to empower others to do that. Not to agree with me, but to do that. And now that I come to the end of my time in studying this book, I've come to the conclusion that knowing you is far more important than knowing every detail of this book. I've come to the conclusion that truth is a person, not a creed, not a theology, not a denomination. And I thank you for the peace that comes with knowing your Bible, a peace that comes from hearing the weird things said in your name, but knowing enough of your book that you know where the road is, you know where the ditches are, and you know where the barbed wire fences are. I pray for these people that I've come to love that you would give them a personal knowledge of the Bible based on their exercising the principles and time it needs to become a Bible student, that you would protect them and me from the evil one. We know that when all is said and done, that our theology, none of our theologies are perfect, that all of us are warped by Adam, warped by America, warped by personal preferences, we know, Lord, that none of us fully understand. But when we stand before you, when we come in confusion and need, we feel like that our daddy is welcoming us home. In Jesus' name, amen.